we are preparing to go live stream. The little icon is creeping across my screen. And looks like we are ready to go. All right, would you like me to get things kicked off, Jude? Yes, please do. All right, well, um, welcome everybody. This is our, our very last session for the 2020 uh, Argo program. Um, so first, let me say congratulations to all of our Argonauts. You, you have made it. Um, I feel, I, certainly from my perspective, I feel like it went by really, really quickly. I don't know how you guys feel, but um, it's kind of amazing that we're here in mid-November and kind of looking back on all that you've experienced um, so congratulations. I, I do want to uh, welcome all of our other uh, viewers. Um, we've got parents and guardians and friends and uh, teachers and district administrators, all uh, who are tuning in to see what you've done. Um, and I do want to say um, uh, our CEO, President and CEO, Dr. Eleanor Smalley, really wanted to be with us tonight, and uh, we've been keeping her up to speed on all the progress that you've made and, and how great it's been going. Um, she does send her regards and congratulations as well to the Argos, and if we've got any of our Jason superintendent friends out there uh, watching, she sends her regards to you as well. Uh, and we would just want to thank all of you so much for being um, a part of Jason and a part of the Argo program. It's a really special, as I shared with all of you uh, in our first session, it's a really special uh, you know, club that you guys are all a part of now. And I hope you've gotten a taste of what the experience is and you know why we love this part of Jason so much. Um, so, you know, it's a weird year. Um, this was a different way of doing the Argo program. We told you from the get-go, it was kind of a big experiment for us uh, in, in doing Argo stuff virtually. And I, I hope that you all agree as much as Jude and I and the bug chicks feel like it went really, really well. And the reason that it went really well is because you guys were all so game to do everything and try everything and learn all of this new stuff and go out and capture insects and do, you know, do all of the things that we're gonna hear about tonight. Uh, so I just can't express enough how um, thrilled we are that you've been uh, on this journey with us. Um, again, we can't wait to hear the results of all that you have learned and discovered and uh, the, the challenges that you faced and how you overcame them. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, see if I've covered everything I wanted to, uh, to share here. Um, I, the other point I want to make here is, you know, we've, we ventured into this not knowing how it was going to turn out. Uh, I have to tell you, it has gone so well that we've like been trying to do more of this. So we've been like writing it into grants and pitching it to other partners. And we're like, you just, you have to uh, see what our Argos have uh, accomplished. So we're all going to do that tonight together. Um, again, just thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, you are now officially Argo alumni in about an hour. Uh, so you're part of this 30-year-old uh, family that keeps on expanding every year, but it's, uh, it's really wonderful to have you. Uh, we will certainly never forget the 2020 Argo experience. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to, back to you, Jude, or over to Christy next, I think. Over to Christy and Jessica. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, to our 2020 Argos, you know who we are, but we're going to just introduce ourselves really quickly to anyone who's joining us through the live stream. My name is Christy Reddick. And my name is Jessica Honecker. And we are the Bug Chicks. Yeah, we are entomologists who teach about the amazing world of insects and spiders. And beyond that, we also use arthropods uh, as, as tools to engage students in this process of, of science. And we work in empowerment and educational potential in everything that we do. Yeah, and so on that note, let's focus in people. Tonight you're giving presentations and I know that some of you 
are feeling a little bit nervous. So I'm just going to quickly help you with this. If you're feeling a little bit nervous, just kind of like look at me like, yes, I'm feeling nervous. You don't have to give a thumbs up because we don't want to like blow our cover, right? Okay, yes. So <laughs> I can see your faces. I get it. Um, all you need to do tonight is show us with enthusiasm, like with the enthusiasm that you have already shown us for the last, what, 12 weeks that we've been together is just communicate to us your science. And it doesn't matter if you gathered no data, if the data was zero, this, the, the gathering of data, the asking of questions, that is the process of science. And I think we've learned that this, this kind of semester going, going forward in this project. We are super proud of each and every one of you. Someone said, I'm worried that I'm gonna let you down. There is no way that any of you could let us down tonight. We, we are on your side 100% from here until the end of time. Got it? Okay, and I am just really, really excited to see what you've created for us. All right, good. No need to be nervous. Jude? And on that note, I'm Jude Kessel and I am the Argonaut Expedition Leader in, in this world of the virtual world. I've been the <clears throat> facilitator. I don't know if you could call me Zoom mom or not, but um, you know, something along those lines to keep everybody uh, moving forward. And I, I just want you all to know that um, Christy and Jessica were on um, text messaging me a little bit ago, super excited and nervous for you prior to, so you don't have to be nervous they were all taking all of that and being nervous for you. So you're going to do great. And however it works out, it's going to be great. I've been so impressed by your diligence and your attention to detail and your <clears throat> enthusiasm for um, when I was talking to Madison this afternoon about, you know, when this was supposed to be dealing with the ocean or dealing with, you know, stuff in Costa Rica, you guys have just done a marvelous your attitudes have been marvelous. So I will hush up. Um, I anticipate that as much as you all try to stay within your three minute time limit, it's okay if you go over. If it starts to go into 30 minutes, I might cut you off. But um, I'll, I'll wave or something or send you a chat message that if you're starting to go over. So with that, uh, we have Nathan and Nemdi who should be the first ones ready to uh, present. And if Christy and Jessica, you guys could pin them. And then the two of you start the share screen process. So at the bottom of your Zoom thing, you should see share screen. If you click on that, you should be ready to go. There we go. You are awesome. Hi everyone, my name is Nathan Cronin and alongside my partner, um, Nemdi Amanambu, we studied the frequency of cricket chirping. Hold on one second, it's loading. There it is. Um, we studied the frequency of cricket chirping and response to humidity. And of course, we could not have done this without the amazing bug chicks and the Jason Learning Argonaut program. Now I'll pass it over to Nemdi and she'll be talking about our question and hypothesis. You have to unmute yourself, Nemdi. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, my name is Nemdi Amanabu, and um, here's our question and hypothesis. So our question was that how does humidity affect the frequency of cricket chirps? And our hypothesis was as humidity increases, cricket chirps will also increase because crickets frequently chirp in the summer, and that usually has higher humidity, even though we often look to temperature as the effect, we thought that maybe humidity was the one that was affecting cricket chips. So here's our data and observations. Uh, so the species that we had was so that we could control the, uh, the temperature and the humidity. At the start of the data collection, there were no cricket chirps. And this is before we separated the male and female crickets. Once we did that, the crickets would only chirp when we were far away from the container. But once we approached them, they would stop. 
even if I was 10 feet away from them, they would immediately stop. And I would be very frustrated with that because it made it hard to collect data. Uh, the crickets seem to have no preference with light or darkness. Even if, it, even if it was light during the night or dark during the day, they seemed to chirp regardless. It just changed when I would approach them. And the crickets lasted about 15 days before all of them died. So here's our data. As you can see, a lot of zeros. And as I said before, it was because I was near them when I was trying to collect data, which uh, prevented them from chirping. So even though our data was a bit botched, research done by Thomas J. Walker, a past professor at the University of Florida, found that humidity actually had very little effect uh, on cricket trips. Even though some research would show that it did have effect, uh, Walker thought that this was very minimal and not of significance. Uh, Nathan will now present our conclusion in our infographic. So for our conclusion, it was shown that our data did not support our hypothesis. As that humidity was increasing, we did not observe an increase in the frequency of cricket chirping. However, in future experiments, we would try to um, stay our distance from the crickets. This could include putting a recording device in the room with the crickets to try to leave them by themselves. Also, we did have a humidity probe. Um, it broke halfway through our experiment. So having one um, throughout the whole experiment would just help accurate measurements. For our infographic, as you can see, the title is the frequency of cricket chirping and response to humidity. And our main point here was that throughout all of our different humidities, it was consistent. With our high, which was two tablespoons of water, the middle, which was one, and the low, which was zero, there was the same amount of chirps throughout. And these are our sources, like Namdi said, we did use scholarly sources such as Thomas to help conclude our data. And that is it. Well, awesome. I think everybody needs to unmute and give some round of applause and thumbs up. Uh, you guys well done. Perfect. Nice. That was excellent. Awesome. 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 I, I just wish we had more time for people to ask questions, but unfortunately that would have us here until midnight, I'm sure. So you guys did great. Very nice coordination. You practice. I'm impressed. And so we're going to move to um, Doddridge, where we have Carter and Heidi and um, Walter, one of the teachers, is able to join us tonight. So I am going to be the one to share screen because I will be sharing their slide presentation. So here we go. And all right. Hold on one second, Jude. Um, yeah. We just need to unpin NIMD. Okay. Because we adore you, NIMD, but we need, to, I, we need to make sure that the speakers are pinned. There we go. Okay. Excellent. All right. So we have Heidi and, and I'm going to move into present here. So you guys will have to give me a clue when you want me to move forward. Okay. Um, so I'm Carter and this is Heidi and uh, we're from Doddridge County, West Virginia. So little tiny small town in uh, North Central West Virginia. And we were lucky enough to be a part of the Jason Argonaut program 2020 Sounds of Science. So, um, you know, this is going to be our presentation. I hope you enjoy. So yeah, we'll just go. All right. Um, first and foremost, um, I was super excited when I first um, discovered what our problem was going to be. It took me and Heidi multiple weeks to come up with a solid idea for, um, you know, a presentation. But we decided that we were going to do um, crickets based on population. So do crickets in a more densely populated area have adaptations to increase their potential sound output as compared to the same species in a more rural area, such as where we live? Um, our hypothesis was that as a group, we believe that crickets will um, have a higher sound output in urbanely populated areas on average, 
Um, that's just because of the more surrounding noise pollution that they have to drown out in order to survive, mate, etc. So that's pretty much where that thinking came from. Okay. Um, yeah, you go. Whoa. All right, go back one one slide real quick. All right. Um, so how do you got this one? Okay. What exactly are you studying? The species we chose to study was the cricket. We decided on crickets because they are a more common insect species in West Virginia where our research is being conducted. Okay, so essentially a cricket, it's a really common animal um, pretty much all around the United States, especially in West Virginia where we're from. Um, males are the only ones that will really produce that distinctive chirp. It's during a process called stradulation in which the scraper, which is located on, their, on the top of their front wing, It'll rub together and create a sound. Um, its volume is going to be amplified by the wing's surface area. So the bigger the wing, obviously, the more sound will be created. Um, and they do this to attract female mating partners. Next slide. You got it. We tested the data for eight straight days. The days included November 2nd to the 8th. And we also recorded information three times a day, 6 a.m., 12 p.m. and 6 p.m. We tested this data by writing it down, writing down specific data as such as the time, the weather, and stuff like that. Uh, we collected data from three different settings, two rural areas and one urban area. We are recording this data in our field journals and phones. Okay, um, so basically, um, we had really detailed um, field notebooks for this one. We were accompanied by our teacher, Walter Sias, who's on the call. So, hey, Mr. Sias, <laughs> shout out to you. Um, so basically, you know, he helped us get um, our stuff from Huntington, West Virginia, which um, if any of you do know West Virginia or have visited West Virginia, it's the second most populous um, city, single city in the state behind only Morgantown. So um, that and Charleston kind of share that second spot, which is our capital. So that's kind of crazy. Um, so basically, yeah, the three of us worked together on these um, seven days. It was a Monday through Sunday thing for um, three times a day. We tracked humidity, temperature, air quality, their surroundings, and um, some basically some other miscellaneous notes. Um, so a journal narrative there. And so, yeah, we had different tools we used. Um, Mr. Sias, I'm pretty sure, has a Samsung and we have iPhones. So that's like a little bit of a change in um, technology there. He uses sound meter by sound dev. Um, you know, obviously those things are gonna vary person by person based on the app store that you have and the um, resources that you're available to. So it's really um, hard to generalize the tools you use when separated like I um, alluded to earlier. So it's best to use individual stuff for data or data collection, you know, just to make sure you get the best results you can possibly get and then we'll compile them later. Next slide, please. All right, you got it. Okay, so the data here is our field journal. Then we have a graph of the humidity conditions, wind speed, wind direction, and the barometer, and the time and the weather here. That's for the urban, and that's for the rural. And then you have um, an example of like the time and date in this notebook. And then here's a map of where Doddridge County is, and then a star for Huntington. Okay, so um, based on the results that we gathered, our hypothesis technically was correct, but it was not in the depth that we originally had intended for it to be. Um, the cold weather essentially deafened the crickets <laughs> in the rural environment. So although we have like a lot of crickets in abundance, most of them were just shut out because um, their energy output needs to be saved for food conservation and things to keep them alive rather than for mating. So they don't really do it as much in the cold and therefore have no need to chirp. Um, there were still faint sounds available in our urban testing area almost 100% of the time, which was still pretty interesting to me that um, the urban areas still had them, although they were faint, that they were still available when we literally could not get a single thing if we poked it with a stick, it was insanity. <laughs> there was no sound, <laughs> not at all. All right, next slide here. 
Um, yeah, so like I said, many factors, but mainly in the environment and uh, mother nature kind of derailed our original experiment. Um, to drastically improve our audible test percentage for next time, I would say um, carrying out the same experiment. I really do believe in the way in which we carried out this experiment, but do it in either the month of June, July, or August. Those hot temperatures and high humidities are really going to um, draw those crickets' attention. And trust me when I say by living in a rural area, me and Heidi both can agree they are very loud in the summertime. So I feel yes. like we would get much better results for all three of our testing, you know, times. All right. So these are um, a couple of my reflections. I don't want to go into too much depth here because I accidentally wrote too much and I don't want to go over time limit, but I already have. So um, <laughs> I originally thought that I'd be uninterested at the topic at first glance because um, I was originally supposed to be in a design thinking group in Silicon Valley. But um, and I ended up finding myself waking up extra early around 5.30 a.m. Despite the bitter cold, the lowest I recorded in was 28 degrees Fahrenheit um, just to collect data. I was just super excited to get out there and like, you know, be a part of this process. And I was really sad that the first time in a long time that I'd been so heavily involved in science, I yielded subpar results. So that's just really disappointing to me personally, but you know, you're not going to be perfect every time. Um, my mindset completely shifted on its head. I originally had no plans of pursuing science after high school, but now I really want to, like, like I said earlier, um, volunteer at youth science fairs and other means like this. I just want to help educate the younger generation. That's why I want to go into teaching. And I really feel like that's just another way to, you know, get a crack at them and hopefully teach them these important skills because honestly, without you guys, I wouldn't have these skills as great as I do now. So I'm really thankful for that. And um, seeing us all grow closer, seeing us all grow closer over a phone screen is mesmerizing. It's crazy to think that a program so heavily rooted in collaboration and innovation did so well without any face-to-face -face interaction. The fact that I haven't seen you guys and you're hundreds and thousands of miles away, but I still act, feel like I know you, that to me is insanity. And I'm just so proud of what we've accomplished as a group. And I'm so proud of what we've accomplished as Doddridge County. You know, coming from a small school, I'm just, you know, I'm overwhelmed, really. So, all right, next slide. Again, I'm so sorry, um, <laughs> but this had to happen. So um, the most challenging part for me personally was to have such an amazing opportunity. And then like most things in 2020, when nothing really goes to plan, um, everything went completely virtual. And despite this being thrown on us in May, you know, after we'd already been selected, we all overcame this and became better citizen scientists and people because of it. So that's really, you know, one of those things that I'd like to say as a reflection, um, it's just, it's important to know that we're all better people because of this, even if we didn't get to really meet and have the experience as much as we wanted to. And I'll let you guys read the last two real quick, but I just want to say one more time that I'm super proud of everybody's accomplishments. Uh, I did not write as much as Carter did, <laughs> but I'll just read mine. At first, I wasn't a fan of bugs like at all. It honestly took me a couple weeks to get used to studying insects. At first, I was not a bug fan. Bugs creeped me out. But now I am intrigued by the simple sightings of bugs. I now take pictures of them in order to learn more about the crawling creatures of Earth. Through Jason learning and this 10-week experience, I've gotten out of my comfort zone and imp to improve my research abilities. I can accomplish a task no matter how difficult it seems. Jason learning has really helped me because I am more of a shy person. And honestly, this is kind of nerve wracking to me. So it really has helped me step out of my comfort zone to even present today. Awesome job. Awesome job. So, yeah. um, if you could, Jude, real quick, just like I know I shared that um, Google Drive thing with you. If you could pull up our infographic, that's the last thing I wanted to show. If not, Absolutely. we don't have time. Don't worry about it. Nope. I well, we will do it. All right. <laughs> I just have to switch, switch, switch doodads here. Let me go back. One more thing here. And by the way, Carter, while, um, of course, everything has popped up and I've lost it. So um, I think we should move on. But while Carter was talking, I got a text message from your superintendent, Carter. And your superintendent Isn't says, Carter repeats as a class A individual state champ. <laughs> so congratulations. That is just so, so awesome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so awesome. So 
Guys, sorry about the infographic. I don't know where it's hiding. That's okay. When, we, when we find it, if we're, Jude will keep looking for I it. I will. <laughs> and we'll, we want to see it. That was, that was super awesome. Thank you. And I, uh, you know, I, you'll see in the chat that um, you made some of us quite emotional. So it won't be the last time tonight that I cry. I'm pretty sure. I, I'm going to be like weeping the whole night and then I'm going to cry all night. But, um, but yeah, thank you both very much. That was, that was lovely. Loving this, loving it. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for giving us the opportunity. It means a lot. All righty. So um, all of a sudden Chrome has decided I need to update in the middle of all this. So <laughs> um, that's part of uh, the problem here. So you guys, yay. Awesome job. Thank you for sharing your insights. That's really, really, really meaningful. So um, the next two who are up are Fra Lainey and Brandon, who are from Franklin. So um, if Brandon, are you going to share the slides? Or Lainey, are you going to share the slides? I'm going to share the slides. And also, I would like to um, say to anybody in Franklin, mm. to anybody in Virginia, we're from Franklin City, not the county. There's a difference between the two. <laughs> oh, I'm in It's okay, relax. You're all right. You're fine, you're fine. Lainey, what we're gonna do is, um, I have to unpin Heidi and Carter. Hold on, give me a second, you guys. Everybody calm down. Okay. Yeah, Lainey, you got this. Now, <laughs> you Lainey, got this. I'm going to pin you. Where are you, sweetie? You've got the, Oh, there you are. And um, and you've got this. We're all friends here, and we, we adore you. All right? <laughs> go for it. Do you, do you know how to share your screen? You're ready. Yes, I... Okay, go for it. So let me go ahead and get this in a presentation mode. And I just realized I'm on the wrong slide. That's okay. okay. I hope y'all like slide seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, before I get started, I want to thank Mr. Lily for going through this and refining everything. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Getting through. Oh. And okay, so. I decided to see how distance affects crickets and how they would react to it since, I mean, you know. Um, my hypothesis was if a group of crickets are distanced from females, the volume and frequency of the male's troops will increase. Um, You're doing good. Keep going. You're doing awesome. Um, specifically, the research project is supposed to be studying the effects of separation on separating crickets and examining the changes in volume and frequency of the male's chirps. Research. Of course, I think everybody used brown house crickets because they're the easiest to get. In Virginia, they're um, in Virginia. They're a pure cricket. We are examining the chirping process produced by males once the males and females have been physically separated, since males only produce chirping sounds when females are away, and males produce that sound by rubbing their four wings together. I remember hearing when I was younger, it was their four legs. I don't know why people told kids that. Um, Brandon and I used similar materials. Um, of I had less crickets. He had 50 males and 50 females. We only had 60 together and we didn't count how many males there were and how many females there were. Um, we both had cricket keepers, but I had like um, ones you find in like hardware stores and one for any type of bug. And of course, cricket diet 
uh, cubes, a thermometer, an audio recorder, and a tape measure to find out how far away they were from each other. Um, we got crickets from PetSmart and separated them by gender. Um, they were placed for the first couple of days, they were outside and then we moved them inside since it was getting too cold because of seasons. So they stayed at a regular um, loop between temperatures of 71 and 75 degrees in Fahrenheit. Um, both of them experienced the fluctuations since they were in the same house. Uh, Everything else for them stayed the same, but on certain nights I would record from 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. And I couldn't include any of the audio in this because the audio was too long to go through and the computer I'm using is too old to export anything onto it. Um, they were kept, the distances they were kept away from each other ranged from one foot away and over 15 feet away. And that's when they were in different rooms. Um, that's the difference between Brandon's setup and my setup. I tried to get a picture of them with the recorder we used beside it. And um, Brandon got a better picture than me because mine was in a bedroom. Um, we're, we both uh, live in Franklin, Virginia. I'm not sure if Brandon was here during the experiment, but um, I they never left my house, so they stayed in Franklin. Oh, I skipped over the field journals. Uh, that's a... Um, that's a spreadsheet of all the information we gathered. You can see the first couple days it was colder and they were not separated. And everything after that, it was just separating them further. Um, data that we collected, uh, zero, anything, nothing, because none of the males chirped. We had a false case of them chirping because while I was listening back to the audio, birds were chirping outside. And I had to listen to that bit like five times. Project did not go as expected. I don't think anyone's went as expected because you can't really control if a cricket chirps or not. Um, and Due to the types of crickets we used and several other people saying their, chirp, their crickets weren't chirping for a very long time, uh, we thought there were difficulties. And since I kept them outside during the cold, that might have stunted their growth. So my the hypothesis that if female crickets are distance from female crickets, the volume and frequency of the male crickets will increase. Um, that was not true at all from what I gathered. So future research considerations, one potential direction that I would have uh, done differently is doing it at a different time of the year since it's getting colder, that might affect them more and also just this year in general. While the temperature in the testing environment was regulated, the, there could be some potential changes in activity levels during different seasons. So um, research shows that male crickets are more active and the frequency of their chirping warming during <laughs> during warmer weather, weather such as in the summer. This means that we might have more activity with crickets if it was 
done during summer months. Um, another potential direction would be to continue to perform the experiments at different distances for experimenting. We chose three different distances to collect data, but in the future we could try diff farther distances or somewhere in between what we had. Um, I did see uh, crickets melting a lot. So um, I didn't actually get to watch them molt because they molted at night, but I saw one that had already molted and they do this a few times during their lifespan, which is also very short. So um, I felt more comfortable around crickets by the end of this. Um, I could check if they had enough water without being afraid of them jumping on my hand. So, um, I did, I'm more comfortable around insects now as well. Um, I, I'm a hands-on person, so I really like that about this. And Christy and Jess, I liked working with you guys. You, you're very nice, I'm gonna say that. <laughs> um, the most challenging part was time management because of school and working on research because I'm doing everything virtually. So I have to manage myself with everything. And this opportunity has allowed me to get more exposure on in working on scientific research and also gaining exposure, working with insects and caring for them since I have never cared for insects before. Um, grateful for working uh, with everybody, all the past Argonauts and the bug chicks and of course credits. But that's it. <laughs> You did awesome. Yeah. I know you can't see chat when you're sharing, but you had a little cheering section over in the chat <clears throat> saying way to go and awesome job and mm -hmm. all of that. So you deserve a round of applause. I know that wasn't easy for you, but you did it. And that is pretty amazing. That should be, you should be pretty proud of yourself. You did it. And, um, and you're, you're a much more natural communicator than I think you give yourself credit for. Mm -hmm. You have a real, um, you you have a real way with words and a and sort of a natural comedic bent and i think lean into that go for mm -hmm. it You're, i think you did great and i loved that picture of the molting um and and that that was a really surprising result for you and i i think that's fantastic yeah and i want to echo to um something that jude you mentioned um laney you didn't see what was in the chat necessarily mm -hmm. but i want to give kudos to every single person that is here right now doing this because I am, I am so impressed with how supportive you are of each other. You're like blowing my mind right now. I'm reading these, these notes to each other. And I'm like, oh, this is so good. And I am being absolutely serious about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Christy and Jessica and probably Cayenne and a few others have a tissue box or should have <laughs> uh, within reach. So we're, we're going to move on. So, you know, students, you've done an awesome job. Cayenne's going to be the first teacher to present. So just so you don't all think that the teachers have it, you know, down. Cayenne was pretty nervous um, herself today. So we're going to have Cayenne get ready to present here. So if you would uh, click your share screen, Cayenne, and then one of the chickies, pin her down. There she is. Now, when I click share, am I doing yes, you the whole screen? screen? Okay. Um, you can do your whole screen wherever your presentation shows up. Can you see it? It says, there you go. So now you just click on the present button in the far right. And you're good to go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kyanne Butler, and I am a teacher in Spring ISD. This is my first experience as an Argonaut with Jason. So this was uh, kind of like scary, but exciting at the same time. Just a little bit about me. I am a teacher. This is my virtual classroom. And I'm also a bug nerd in training. And the bug chicks are my heroes. Um, <laughs> I have been in the classroom for a long time. And I've never had an experience quite like this before. It was really just life changing for me. I just want to start off by saying that. Um, amazing experience. I actually, my students are, some of them I gave the YouTube link to. I hope they're maybe joined to listen, but it has been completely life changing for me, not only as a teacher, but just as a person. I do want to say this before I get into my study. Thank you so much, Jason Learning, for picking me to be a part of this. Bug Chicks. Oh my goodness, I've never met. I just have never met scientists like you before that are so passionate about what they do and it is contagious. So thank you so much for everything that you are doing. You have no idea. The other Argos that are in this program, thank you because you inspire me. I mean, the students, the teachers, everything, my teacher friends, and of course my family for putting up with me going out to listen to crickets. And they didn't really understand why. All right, so this was my face when I got the call from Jude that I needed to be a part of this. I was like, what? Okay, I'm coaching volleyball, I'm teaching. How am I gonna do this? But in my heart, I was like, yes, how could I not be a part of this? Yes, I'll do it. But I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I don't like bugs. I never had an interest in it. I didn't know a lot about it, so I was terrified, but I will tell you it has been quite the journey. So I am a, officially a bug dork. I really think I am because I enjoyed the experience so much. So here was my problem that I investigated. What effect does road noise have on the frequency of cricket sounds? Um, I live in the Houston area, which is uh, heavily populated, lots of major interstates and roads. And I just began to wonder like, how does our noise affect crickets? And they rely on sound. So how does what we do impact what they need to do to survive? So my prediction was that during high periods of road noise, the frequency of cricket sounds would be higher, that they would, ad they would adapt to higher noise in their area. That's what I thought would happen. Little did I know there was so much more to this than what I thought. So I chose crickets because it's an insect that I was familiar with. I wanted to study them in nature and I was just curious. I didn't know a lot about them and I learned a whole lot during this process. Um, I chose, iNaturalist I, I was my platform for starting off, like where am I going to do this? And what species am I gonna look at and all of that. So I, in mapping out, um, the area where I live and also where my school is, there were um, four different species of crickets that were found in those areas. So I don't know specifically what species I was actually listening to during the study, but these were some of the species that were found in the area where I study. So I'm not quite sure if it was one of these four, but based on iNaturalist, um, these were the ones that happened to show up frequently in the area where I was um, getting my data. I did a little background research because I wanted to know like, are other people studying this like me? Like, what, you know, is there other research out there? And I found a couple of other studies that were done. And then also I did a little background on just how crickets even make sounds because I didn't know a lot about that and why they make sounds for mating, but also to warn against predators and also for territorial warnings. And I didn't even know that they sing different sounds depending on what they're trying to communicate. So I had to kind of look into that. A lot of the studies that I read about, they also um, kind of looked at the effects of noise pollution on male cricket chirping. 
and that when they are in close proximity with road noise, that it does impact their sound. And also it, exposure to it over time decreases their energy. So I was like, okay, this is probably really good then. Other people have invested in the studies. And um, I tried to find a range of different research studies. Like this one was about truck mining sites and the road noise. And there was some consistency in what they found too. So I became motivated after this that I really had something good here that I could that I could really uh, work with. So in my data collection, I chose to, of course, use my phone to collect the audio. I chose a length of four days and I did two recordings each day. I picked times where the, the road where I was in, the, in that area, where it was sort of high peaks of uh, traffic noise and then times where it's not so high to kind of have the contrast. And then I did 30 seconds of sound each time. I used my phone and then I converted it through Sodaphonic and then I used Audacity for the frequency analysis. And then of course my field journal for the qualitative data. So going into my data, um, basically every day in my uh, field journal, I recorded the weather conditions, the location, the time of day and what I was observing. Um, one of the things that I didn't expect initially in the beginning, the later it got in the day, the more cricket sounds I heard, because I guess they're nocturnal. And when there was more noise, I would hear um, not pulsating sounds, but more of a long sound, six to seven seconds long, and they would overlap. So I was like, okay, that's pretty interesting. But then it got cold. So after the first day of collecting data, I didn't hear any crickets. So the next two days when I, I still tried to go at the same time and same location and all of that, I, did, I heard either very faint noises or no noises at all. Even when there was little road noise, I still couldn't pick up the sounds. So for the next two days after that, I didn't hear anything at all. And then once it got mild again, the temperature went up again, that's when I heard them again. So in collecting my data, I realized temperature is a variable that I didn't consider. I didn't consider that, you know, so maybe had I done this study a little earlier in the year, maybe in the summertime, that I could have had a little bit more concrete um, data in this process. So as I collected it and I kind of looked at the comparison between the earlier times when there wasn't a lot of traffic to when there, when there was, I did see some variation, but again, that temperature coming in, that little cold spell kind of threw off a lot of my um, data that I was getting. I did do a frequency analysis of the day that I had the highest success with cricket chirps and where I didn't have any at all. So this was a day where I heard them the loudest and I looked at kind of the frequency dips and changes in the graph. I'm not that knowledgeable on audacity, I have to be honest, but I was able to see some comparisons in just the graph itself and where the frequency changes were occurring. One thing that I can tell you that I definitely would do to improve this is um, lot more time of that. I feel like maybe four days wasn't enough. And I also did not know how to separate the sound. So like when I'm looking at this frequency graph, it's all of it together, not just the cricket sound. So it was kind of like if I had a little bit more, if I had spent some more time just being knowledgeable on this, I could get my data could be a little more concrete with that. But um, did I prove my hypothesis? Um, I don't think I fully proved it because I just didn't have enough of it. And then there were so many other variables that were introduced that I didn't think about. But I will tell you this, the process is what I feel I took more away from. Being able as a teacher, I mean, those of you who are teachers, when you're in a classroom, everything's so predictable. You have your lab, you have your beginning, your end. With this, Nature doesn't care that I had a presentation tonight. You know, it's like whatever is happening in nature, you just have to go with it. 
So it allowed me to be vulnerable, which is something that I just felt like I hadn't done that as an educator. And to have that open inquiry, to be able to come up with more questions at the end than answers, that has impacted me in the classroom. I have to be honest when I'm teaching because now it's like, don't be afraid to ask questions. And it's okay if you have more questions than answers because that's what real science is. It's not about just getting that one concrete answer. So that's what I learned from this process. I would recommend any teacher do this because it's life-changing. It's like talking about the moon versus like being an astronaut. You know, it's a totally different experience. You know what I mean? Like what you see and hear and experience is so organic. And I just love it. It's such a unique experience. So thank you. My hypothesis wasn't proven fully, but it inspired me to want to do more of it. So I feel like the outcome was more, even though I didn't have the numbers, if that makes sense. Um, so in closing, I just want to tell you one more thing, because I know I've gone over the time. When I was preparing this, I have a 15-year-old son, and he goes, Mom, you didn't prove your hypothesis. You need to go back and change that. Like, you can't, you can't have a conclusion without... And I said, no data is data. You know, it's okay. <laughs> I, said, I said, it's okay. No data is data. And he was like, I never heard that before. And he's 15. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So thank you again. Um, I did do an infographic um, that I'll just share really quickly. Um, kind of like a, the same thing I've already talked about, road noise. And I put some statistics here about the Houston area and how we impact and how it's possible that maybe our noise impacts the population of crickets. I did not know that females can identify chirps of the same species. News to me. I didn't know that, <laughs> but I learned that. So um, anyway, and this is just what I, the process that I went through. Thank you so much for this opportunity. You have changed my life. And I mean that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jude. Thank you, Bug Chicks. Thank you, Argos. And I'm done. Kyan, I think you need to tell the story about your kids when you're trying to record crickets at the, when you were picking up food. Oh, wait a minute, which story? Um, just worrying about what people were thinking when you're on the road. Oh, 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 yes. So <laughs> I got really into this cricket thing. I have to tell you, I felt like a ghostbuster. I would be like going out with the kids and I'm like, shh, shh, crickets are here. Everyone be quiet. I have to go out there. I have my notebook. They're like, mom, what are you doing? And I'm like, no, everyone quiet. I'm the expert. Let me listen to this. The bug chicks have trained me. I am going to record this. And this day, I just got like, I don't know. <laughs> they were like, what is happening to you? <laughs> I'm becoming a bug dork. That's what it is. But yes. yeah, it really, it, it really impacted me so much. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. So thank you, you could, so much. That was. Yeah. Uh, Re go ahead and read the chat now that now that you have access to it. Oh, it is, okay. <laughs> it is, uh, yeah. You you really yeah. We're we're crying. We're cheering. We're laughing. Uh, like uh, it was fantastic. Yeah, that was fantastic. Was fantastic. And I want to say, Cayenne was nervous. So even if you are a, an exceptional speaker, like Cayenne just proved herself to be. Mm -hmm you get nervous, okay? So it is totally fine. Everyone gets nervous. And I don't know who's next, but whoever um, is next. Mary G, Mary Gerber. Mary, you've got this. And I know you're like, really, Cayenne? <laughs> really? You can't live up to the standards. <laughs> <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna be fantastic. You're gonna step up and do it, Mary. We're ready. Okay. I'm gonna pin you. Okay. And then whenever you're ready to share your screen, we are all ready. You pinned the wrong Mary. Oh, wait, wait. Oh. 
<laughs> Mary, you're like, no, it's not my, it's not my turn. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. You'll click on present. There you go. There you go. Awesome. Hi, my name is Jerry Gerber. I did the effects of artificial light on feeder crickets. Um, so as we all know, light pollution is increasing. Um, so is population. Um, so I did mine on um, anthropogenic light, which is basically any uh, pollution that is created by humans. What I'm testing is the effects and preferences of light and uh, dark environment in feeder crickets. So my hypothesis was that um, I predict that the crickets will decrease frequency of chirps per minute when exposed to increasing light intensity. So I basically did <laughs> The same thing everyone else used. I used feeder crickets and they produce their sound by stridulation, which is rubbing two wings together. Um, my experiment steps were each day I would expose them to different light intensities for 24 hours and their chirps would be recorded and um, in between those trials they would have no light exposure. Um, <laughs> So this is a box that I kind of duct taped together to control the light intensity. And I did test it. It was zero lux once closed. Um, this was my setup. It was in a lab. I had about 20 male crickets. I separated them by sex too. Um, my graph on the left has no data because my crickets made no noises at all. Uh, I cheered them on and everything. They didn't do anything. <laughs> um, but I did notice that the cricket population was declining. And I thought, well, well, this is some data. So this was my infographic. It showed the declining population. Um, and it also showed light maps to show the intensity of light in certain areas. And my hypothesis was sort of correct. They're disrupted, disrupted, my bad, by artificial light, but uh, their calls and chirps are not um, as affected. Um, at least I didn't prove that. <laughs> um, things did not go as expected. Um, no cricket chirps, but I think it's definitely something that should be tested in the future. And there's my sources. Thank you for listening. You did did awesome. I yes. think it's interesting that um, you should talk a little more about why you built the box and what the box. What 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 did we talk about with that box? And what 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 is your sort of alternative hypothesis based from that box? Well, my alternative hypothesis was: Did keeping the crickets in complete darkness disrupt their circadian? Um, sequence, which their night, day, daily activity. So, yeah, absolutely. I love that the box was a big hit, Mary. Yep, it was an yeah. excellent to try to try to make them, you know, do their thing, which they weren't quite. And I think you, like um, Laney, was talking about. Didn't you see your crickets molt quite a few times? I did not see them yeah. molt. Oh. You didn't see the molt, but you definitely saw a decrease in vitality because of your torture chamber box that you created. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that's really, I think that's really interesting. And you're right. I, I'm happy that you were able to see, like, oh, there's no data here, but I am, I am noticing that my population is going down. And like, what does that mean? And that you're like, oh, that's data. What, let me follow that path. And I think, I think that's beautiful. That's exactly, that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Yep. Sort of Being able to embrace those pivot guidance. points. Mm. Yeah. Letting, letting what's happening guide us a little bit. I love and that. You, and your infographic. Yes. Beautiful. Great. Are you, you going to keep your crickets? I release them. They're, they're gone. And it's like 32 degrees. <laughs> Anyway, 
is, I think I maybe should have mentioned to people not to release their crickets. <laughs> I overlooked that. That's okay. Well, you did awesome. You, you know what? Awesome. You. Yes. Those crickets are going to give another Mary, animal a nice. Mary, let me unpin you here. How do I? I can't unpin. I have. I can. Only oh, I think you're already this. unpinned. No. There we go. Okay. okay. Who so is our next? Next two you? is Clara and Jane. Oh, nice. So I don't know which of you is going to share your screen. I'm going to Clara. start. Clara's going to share her screen. Okay. okay. And I'm, I'm just going to introduce Clara. I'm Jane Ramos. I'm a teacher Argonaut. And I'm introducing Clara. She's a student Argonaut. We're both from Smithfield, Rhode Island, little Rhode Island over on the East Coast, where we've had crazy weather as well. We had some snow in October, and then we had 70 degree days. Um, just something that Jude alluded to earlier. Yeah, we thought we were going to Washington DC for the expedition on forensics and epidemiology. So this was very different, but nevertheless, it's been a great learning experience for both of us as Jason expeditions always are. I can attest to that. Um, Clara pursued a similar question as Mary did. Um, it was light pollution and its effect on crickets, which is such a timely issue because since the invention of electric light, and especially since World War II, there's been a steep increase of outdoor lighting, and it's generated what's called the modern sky glow. And this is due to the use of more lights with higher luminous efficiency and excessive and careless use of artificial lighting by humans. So Clara designed an excellent investigation to pursue this issue. So Clara, take it away. Hello, I'm Clara Arcan, and I'm going to be presenting the slideshow that I created for this project. So I'm just going to share my screen. Is it loading? No, there we go. Sorry. Okay. So like Mrs. Ramos said, um, we decided to investigate the effect of light pollution on crickets. To start the experiment, I constructed a uh, plan to observe crickets in a natural environment, which ended up being the woods um, in my backyard. And I wanted to simulate light pollution with an unnatural light source so that I would be able to observe the changes in their behavior. Uh, for my first attempt at the experiment, I had originally bought crickets at a local Petco, and I had put the males in an enclosed tank in my backyard. Um, after a few days, I noticed that they weren't chirping, so I decided to adjust my procedure to get some other data. So for my second attempt, I had been hearing like a lot of cricket activity in the woods behind my house, so I just, just decided to study the natural population that was already apparent. Um, and I decided to use a bright outdoor light that was in my backyard as the unnatural light source because it was bright enough to reach the perimeter of my yard and be effective in simulating light pollution. So with my new procedure, I began collecting actual data. Um, I collected one minute of audio at 6.30, 7.30, 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. And for the first few days, um, I turned the light off and I just observed them in their natural behavior. Um, and then the next two days, I turned my outdoor light on, which is over here, um, and observed any changes. And this is my backyard lit up. And I also recorded the decibels of the chirps using an app on my phone each night. So then I or oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> So here are two audio recordings that I collected. So I'm gonna try to play them. So I don't know, make sure your mics are off so I can play this. Um, this one is from the first night when the lights were off. So hopefully this sounds okay. Um, and this is the recording from the third night when the lights were on. So hopefully that sounded okay. 
Um, but I was able to tell a really big difference in both of the recordings. I could hear not only a difference in the volume and the frequency, but also in the pitch, which I found really interesting. So I decided to create a spreadsheet to organize the data. And here you can see the decibels from the first two nights when the lights were off pretty drastically decreases um, within the next two days when the lights were on. I think the average for the first two days was about um, 84 decibels. And then the next two days was like 51 decibels. So to conclude, looking at my results, I now have a better understanding of how light pollution impacts insects. My data shows their behavior to have been disturbed by the simulation as their chirps were obviously much quieter and less frequent, um, proving that light pollution may confuse them or even interfere, interfere with their lives. And future studies could investigate any negative impacts on natural populations um, and what light pollution could mean for maybe mating patterns or how they just generally act. And this project has not only allowed me to better understand the human race's effect on um, natural populations of insects, but it's also strengthened my interest in the field of science and has given me a lot of great experience um, in active research. So thank you to the bug chicks and thank you for Jason for this really great experience. That is it. Yay. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Excellent. I know at the beginning it was a uh, one you had initially talked about maybe doing sound, the effect of sound, but I found your switch to light very interesting. And um, as you and both Mary pointed out, um, you know, light pollution has, you know, I think of it as the sky is having the, the problem, but I never thought of it on insects. And so thank you for, for sharing that. It's amazing. Amazing. Awesome. Well done. Yeah, great job. And we, everyone in the chat, you go, go, go look at the chat now and see everyone, everyone googly eyed over your data table. <laughs> that was, it was great. And, and I really also like, I, I'm really liking how, how you're taking the chance to kind of move things around on your slides too, and, and position things in a way that makes it easy for everyone to see what's mm -hmm. going on. I'm enjoying that. So right. next, we have a couple of a teacher and students who broke away from the crickets and are doing bees. So I'd like to introduce Amy and Lucy. Oh, nice. So I think Amy is going to present. Yep, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me get my screen up here. All right. So we are the Bee Buddies. This is, um, I'm Amy Thompson and that is Lucy Baudry. And we are from the Ross Oakle School District in Butler County, Ohio. So what exactly are we studying? So we studied the honeybee in different parts of the United States. So um, we had a couple of bees within our area from her uncle. And then um, we looked at a couple through iNaturalist. The bees produce sounds by flapping their wings. And we had done a little bit of research about why that they flap their wings. And that was through what they call the waggle dance. And um, I actually do a project-based unit in my science class. And I actually do a little waggle dance while I'm teaching the lesson. So why bees? So we were, after a couple of recordings of sounds at night, we decided to work with something that we both knew a little bit about. So Lucy has an uncle who is also a beekeeper. And then my project-based lesson with language arts and science that are both on the topics of saving bees. So our problem was, does the health of a honeybee hive correlate to the sounds they make? So we were trying to think, there's a lot of issues right now going on with bees and the loss of bees and um, like colony collapse disorder. There's a lot of things going on. So we were trying to figure out, can we help beekeepers by just determining the sound that the bees make if they can tell if their hive is sick or not and without actually opening it and exposing them to the elements. 
And we figured out the more sound the honeybees make in their hive, the healthier the hive. That was our initial hypothesis. Um, Lou, you want to take over? Sure. So we had many different methods. First, we took a recording of the bees from my uncle's house. Um, and then we used my phone and then took a recording six feet away. Um, I had to wear a bee suit just in case it got stung, which I didn't. So that was good. Uh, we converted um, all the sounds that we got because we also used a mixture of my sounds that I used and then also sounds that we found online. Uh, we converted them into Audacity and then analyzed them. Those are pictures of me taking um, data. Um, in that picture um, that I'm looking at, this little table, um, my uncle actually had um, a beehive collapse last year from some mites. So he was showing me how he treats the hive if he finds one. So that was really cool. So these are our materials. Um, all the um, cities you can see on the far left um, is where is what we found on iNaturalist, which was really cool because we got to hear bee sounds um, from lots of different places around the US. So we were looking also at the temperature and humidity and found some definite connections between the type of weather and humidity. It seems like the, the more humidity actually that active they were. So that was kind of a, a new hypothesis we actually didn't come up with. So we're like, oh, this is another connection that we can make here. Do you want to do this one, Lou? Sure. So all the bees that you can see on the map are places that we found in iNaturalist. I um, and then the bee in Ohio is where I took the recording. <laughs> and then there's other places um, around the US where we got our recordings from that we didn't um, that we didn't take ourselves. So we started to pinpoint with the um, some of the bee recordings that number seven was the active bees and he's over here. So that was an active bee and it was a warmer climate. Our, what we thought were sick bees was over here in North Carolina and what happened there was we thought that they were sick bees because it the hygienic behavior was the name of the, the um, article that we read. And we actually did contact the author of that text and the, she's a scientist and she wrote back right away, which was like amazing. I've never actually had an author reply back and then in within one day. <laughs> so she had said that there was more data that needed to be done to determine if those bees were actually sick and they called it hygienic behavior. So then we learned another definition of that was sick bees are actually as hygienic behavior. As we were going through our data, we thought that they were sick bees as we were talking about, but we wanted to test further to determine if those were actually sick bees and we didn't know what we were doing. So we reached out to the bug chicks and Christy helped us on a Sunday afternoon. She took out her own time to talk with us and taught us about how to use Audacity. And we realized our hypothesis was incorrect, gravely incorrect. <laughs> so we had our tested bees here from Lucy's uncle and here we have the sick bee recording. Um, we normalize this at zero decibels and our, our data shows that there's actually a lot more activity going on in the sick bee recording than there was in the healthy bee recording. And um, that was actually, Christy had showed us how to normalize the data because at first we're like, okay, this is a no brainer. We've got a slam dunk. These are sick bees. And then we normalized it and saw this and we were both like, mind blown, we are messed up. So, um, but then we also were talking with Christy about the fact that maybe these bees were closer to the microphone and that we would need to be, um, get more data on how far away that microphone was from the bees. It could have meant that they were closer than the healthy bees. Maybe that microphone was further away. 
So yeah, no, we were incorrect. <laughs> uh, we couldn't identify healthy and sick bees. And that's kind of what we were looking for. Um, Lucy, do you want to look at these or talk about this one? Sure. So since we couldn't um, identify the sick bees and healthy bees, um, we had to use other outside information. Um, I naturalist really helped because not only was it from other places in the U.S., it had very different temperatures and weather conditions. Um, and my uncle, the beekeeper, told me that when the weather changes, like the day before it rains, the bees are more active than um, if it wasn't going to rain the next day. So we, we looked at our reflections and um, I, I had learned that audac audacity is really, really cool. And I really like iNaturalist as well. And I actually did a lesson with my students today on iNaturalist. So it's really neat to be, you know, um, using things that you can use in the classroom. And that's always been, you know, whenever I have professional development and I attend something, I really wanna take something back with me to use. And I'm using this stuff. Lucy, what was your reflection? Um, I think the best thing was, um, like, we've all done virtual school, especially in March through May. Um, and I think everyone struggled a little bit. But doing this program, it really changed my view on virtual learning because um, this just made it a really cool experience that I think if the pandemic didn't happen, we wouldn't have anything like this. And I'm really grateful for this experience. This is our infographic and um, we had to have our brand up here as the Bee Buddies. And this is basically everything we just talked about. So um, that is it. And thank you very much for your time. Awesome, your brand, the Bee Buddies, I love it. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, I'm also, uh, you know, Christy and Jessica are trying to hold it together um, over there, but they're so, I can see them um you know jessica <laughs> they're like you know wiping away the tears yeah. <laughs> my face is all red i'm like oh. we're gonna be so gross by the end yeah. of this guys <laughs> but yeah, I, I, means wanna, a lot. I, I do want to say like lucy what you just said about gratitude is really oh gratitude's gratitude's my mm -hmm. thing and i just think that i was thinking about this today like if if we had, if the pandemic hadn't happened and we had all gone on our separate Jason Argonaut expeditions, we would not, like some of you would have met Jessica and I, but we would not have met each other. And we would have, we would not have met most of you because we usually go, that Amazon trip is, is, you know, like five to eight students, yeah. um, total of maybe 10 to 12 people with, with Argonaut teachers. And so, um, you know, if there's one thing to be happy for because of the pandemic, it's that we got to do this program with you and we got to meet all of you and I have to stop talking. Who's next? You're here. <laughs> well, I just want um, Amy and Lucy to make sure they look at chat because there were some really beautiful bee puns in the chat. So next we have <laughs> Bree from Wetzel. Hi, I was going to share my screen real quick figure out how to do that. Okay. I think I'm doing it. Oh, wait, no, I'm not. There you go. There we go. Okay, let me click present and I'll get started. Okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Bree Herrick. And I just want to give a quick shout out to my teacher, Argonaut, uh, Mr. Schmaltz. I think he's watching tonight. Um, so this is my journey through the Sounds of Science program with Jason Learning and the Bug Chicks. So our goal is to inspire and educate uh, students everywhere like myself through real science and exploration. So what do we want to know? So through some brainstorming, I decided that my question would be, how does temperature influence cricket chirping? And then I 
formed my hypothesis that seemed very plausible to me. So I decided to say, if the temperature rises, then cricket chirping should occur, should occur more rapidly. And if the temperature falls, then cricket chirping should decrease along with the temperature. And as you can see from this slide, the cricket is also questioning that. So what exactly am I studying? Well, my backyard is full of chirps every night, so I thought that studying the chirps, chirps of crickets along with the temperature would be a perfect thing to study. And a fun fact, crickets rub their body parts together to make a noise which is called sturdilation, and usually males do this to navigate the nighttime dating scene. So, fun fact right there. <laughs> So methods and materials, where, what, and how. So where is the testing location? For me, it was right in my backyard, which is pretty accessible. What are we testing? I decided to test cricket chirps per minute by recording the chirp data and the temperature. And how are we testing the data? So I used my phone timer um, to count a minute for me as I counted the chirps that they made during that time period. So how did I set up my field notebook? And how did I record this data? So as you can see by the picture, I recorded the time, temperature, weather, and cricket chirps per night or per minute every night as much as I could. And that's me right there doing my little uh, data recording. So my field notebook part two. <laughs> So some tools that helped me out on this journey included my phone, the timer app, canva.com, and sodaphonic.com. And I used these every night I could while recording my data. So what is quantitative and qualitative data? So quantitative is measured by the quality of something. So in my case, um, it was the amount of chirps and the temperature every night and qualitative relies on the data like descriptions. So in my case, qualitative was the descriptions of the chirps, which they were mostly very high pitched. And data. So some exciting data that I found um, was this really cool graph I made with Canva. Um, so I decided since the dependent variable relies on the independent variable in graphs that um, I chose to record the temperature as the independent variable and the cricket chirps per minute as the dependent. So my graph ended up showing that cricket chirps do in fact increase as the temperature increases. More data. All right, so I have some sound for you guys. So an example right up here at the top um, of a warmer night of what the cricket sounded like. So that was, um, if that played well, that was what we it sounded started like. the beginning of it. So we heard the first couple chirps, but then it stopped. So. All right, let me try it again. It did the same thing, so that's okay, we get it. All right. So then on another night that was very, very, very cold, um, there was literally nothing nothing outside. So they must have been pretty cold too. That's all I could think. <laughs> so even more data. So where is all of this cricket recording happening? Well, I am in wild and wonderful West Virginia in Wetzel County, and it definitely was wild with all of the cricket chirps that I recorded. So my results and conclusions, was the hypothesis correct? Yes, it indeed was. My graph proved that cricket chirps increased as the temperature increases and vice versa. As the temperature decreased, then cricket chirps also fell with the temperature. And everything went so smoothly, I'm not sure um, if I would change a whole lot, but it went so smoothly and I'm really proud of the outcome.
So here's my infographic. I had to cut it in half to fit it on here. Um, but it just basically shows um, that on the cooler side, the cricket reaction rate slow, which results in chirps to diminish. And with the warmer temperatures, chemical reactions activate and allow crickets to chirp more rapidly. Reflecting on my journey, I am so thankful to have been given this opportunity. I think the coolest thing was to plug in my data in the graph and see my hard work be illustrated. Um, and if you're going to work hard, then you, of course, should definitely do it in a crown. Um, but this journey has been so much fun to explore, and I can't wait to see what comes next. And I just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Jason Learning and the Bug Ticks. You've made this experience amazing. So here are my resources and credits. Way awesome, awesome, awesome. I think the bug chicks and myself are going to hire some of you guys to help us make our slides look cooler uh, because I've seen your slides and other people are like, way, I got to up my game here. Do you have your crown handy? I don't know where I put it. Where's the okay. crown? I'm sort of teasing, but it's a cute picture of you. Awesome. But, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes. That, was, that was fantastic. Um, yeah, you guys are killing us. Go check out the chat because people were just accolades all over the place. Really, mm -hmm. really great. Yes, yes, yes. So next we have Madison. And Madison, you are going to knock this out of the park here. So I definitely hope so. Oh, you will. So are you ready to share your screen? I think you've been pinned already. I am ready. Let me just pull that up. Share and present. Can you see it? Yep, we can. Awesome. Well, hello everyone. My name is Madison Myers. I'm a London High School senior and a part of this year's Jason Student Argonauts. So first we had to create a problem or a question that we wanted to solve during this project. And I came up with how does temperature impact crickets and the sound that they produce? My hypothesis was that crickets would produce more sound with a higher temperature and produce less sound with cooler temperatures. I chose to study the crickets in my backyard due to their large population and some background information. Male crickets produce sound through a process known as sterilization, which uses special body parts to create that sound. Like I said, I was testing in the field beside my house and I was testing the difference in amount of cricket chirps based upon the temperature. Specific steps to my research, I would go out at 1 p.m. every afternoon and I would record a minute's worth of sound. After doing so, I would use weather apps to document temperature, weather, cloud coverage, wind and humidity for that day. After doing so in my field journal, I would replay the sound and count the number of chirps within that minute. I didn't have very many resources, but I did use my iPhone for voice memos and the weather app to record my data. Um, the frequency of data was a week's worth of data and I also got an extra three days. In my field journal, I wrote down everything that's in the slide. So what I wanted to know, my hypothesis, what critter I was studying, the background information, date and time, temperature and Fahrenheit, weather, wind conditions, humidity, title of recording, location, and cloud coverage. And these are just more of my field notebook and what I was writing down. My quantitative data was the temperature, humidity, wind conditions, date and time, cloud coverage, and chirps per minute. The qualitative data that I received was the weather, what I was seeing and hearing, and the conditions I felt around me. So in these pictures, I am writing down in my field journal, the field beside my house, um, my infographic that I did, and all of the sounds that I recorded. Results and conclusions. So my hypothesis was correct. The amount of chirps was much greater when the temperature was higher, and there were fewer chirps when the temperature was cooler. The research went very well. There was a large swing in temperatures the week of my research, allowing me to get a wider range of information regarding my project. 
Did things go as expected? Yes, my test did go as expected upon my prior knowledge leading up to my hypothesis. And it also followed the other research I looked into as I continued my data collection. If I could have done anything differently, I would have liked to get a wider range of information. And that meaning I would have liked to gain more sounds and recorded more to have more information. So more on my testing and results, I performed a 10 day test in which I would record cricket sounds per minute and would record the conditions of that day. After my 10 day experiment, my hypothesis appeared to be correct. On cooler days between the low 40s and mid 50s, cricket chirps ranged from zero to 20 chirps within a minute. When the weather was much warmer from the 60s to higher 70s, cricket chirps ranged from 40 to 60 chirps a minute. Um, Next is my reflections, and I won't bore you with all of the things I wrote. I just wanted to say that I did not know how this experience was going to turn out given the current, current circumstances of this pandemic. I was supposed to be in Belize studying sharks, but we ended up being online and studying bugs. I'm not a firm lover of either technology or bugs, but this opportunity has opened my eyes and has given me a better understanding of both. I can't thank Jason enough for this opportunity, along with Jude, Pat, Michael Browning, which is my principal, and everybody else. Oh, and the bug chip chicks, everybody else that has helped me along the way. And then those are my resources. Can you click on your camera so we can see you again? Maybe. <laughs> there you are. <clears throat> so, um, Hi there. Did did you have any experiences like Cayenne did where people were kind of wondering what you were doing out in the field? Um, so I do have like one story. So um, <laughs> I came in one day, it was really cold and then it started to warm up. And so I had noticed the crickets had started to chirp again. So I ran inside and was all excited. And I was telling my parents that the crickets were chirping and they're like, you know, why are you so excited? And I'm like, I'm finally getting research and they didn't understand quite yet, but no, um, yeah, that's my story. They kind of thought I was weird for being excited over cricket chirps, but. But you're a big I love it. I love that. I'm just gonna say, you know, not that we did, not that anybody did because I, I had this background too as a kid, but like, let let it be known never underestimate someone in a pageant crowd i'm just going to say that right boom now. absolutely 100 percent. you just killed that madison you you were you're clear and confident and take a deep breath and don't forget to believe in yourself all right oh, thank you. okay all right yeah well so, done well done jude where are we going next um next we are going to brooklyn so brooklyn and i met yesterday and she has her slide set to go and so if you guys can unpin madison yep did we got yep, that right was... there you're, you're good and yep. brooklyn are you pretty much ready to go yes i am just make sure to use your your big outside loud voice okay good job and you're gonna share your screen Excellent. There you go. Oh. oh, no. Oh, no. So I think you, yeah, the screen sharing thing is covering up your, your mm -hmm. icon there. So stop screen sharing for a second. <laughs> and when you move the zoom out of the way, make sure that your slides are the last thing you looked at. Let me try again. Yep, and then try again. Otherwise, if you can't get them to screen share, I can screen share yours. And it did it again. I'm so sorry, everybody. No, don't worry, dear. It's OK. Totally no problem. We'll get you sorted. Would you like me to screen share mine? Yes, please. Thank you. Okie doke. I will do that. They're coming up here. 
it's slow, but we're coming up. And so I will screen share and you can do the talking. All righty. You are ready, so go for it, dear. All right, let's get started. So you can introduce yourself. My name is Brooklyn Brown. And where do you live? Ada, Oklahoma, and I go to Bing schools. All righty, and what were you researching? Does time of day affect what species make sound? And can you tell everybody what you and I talked about? How did you come up with your question? How did I come up with my question? Mm -hmm. Every time I go to school in the morning and come back home at night, I hear crickets in the morning. I mean, sorry, I hear birds in the morning and crickets at night. Right, so you we talked about your day. So that was your hypothesis, so. Mm -hmm. Did you think they would make more at night? Mm -hmm. Okie dokie. And so now you can read through this. All right. In this experiment, I tested the sounds of insects and birds in my backyard using my mobile voice recorder to record sounds at 8 a.m., 12 p.m., 7 p.m. for a week and then comparing them in my field notebook. And this slide is pictures of my field notebook and everything I wanted it to include in it, like date, time, temperature, cloud cover, and weather in general. And I'm jealous of your handwriting. Very nice. Each recording is one minute long and taken in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. There were chirping, buzzing, wind and rain in each of these recordings. I'm basically summing up each slide here. Am I on the right slide for you? Can you go to the next slide? Sure. This slide is my ADM recordings with charted weather conditions. So do you want me to try? Um, I'm not able to uh, make it make sound because you are the owner of the slide. So we'll have to try that again. So, okay. Ready for me to move to the next slide? And just so you guys know, I never wake up at 8 a.m. I was sending snaps to my mom every morning. And my parents were so proud of me that I woke up early. That is awesome. All right, this is my 12 p.m. recordings and my 7 p.m. recordings. And this is a picture of my backyard, which is also my recording location. And this is one of my favorite places ever because it's just so nice there and I love it. You got to spend a lot of time out there. Mm -hmm. My hypothesis that birds will make more sounds in the morning compared to insects was correct. I also learned that insects make more sound in the afternoon and die down at night. Things one is expected, but weather changes made the experiment difficult. If I could redo this project, I would have taken more recordings at a warmer time. Before this project, I used to think insects were unimportant. And after this project, I learned insects were pretty interesting. During this project, I feel like I have become more connected to nature and I would definitely do this again. And I wanna thank Jason Learning and the Bug Chicks for making me the weird girl that thinks crickets are cute now. <laughs> thank you for listening, everybody. All righty. You did awesome, Brooklyn. Hey, well Perfect. done. Well done. Well, plus you get props for getting up early because when I, you and I talked about this, you were like, yeah, 
I don't get up too early in the morning. So you did amazing. I'm really proud of you. Your parents are proud of you too. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I just want to say thank you to my mom for, for sending those snaps at eight in the morning and bugging her at work just to show how proud I was of myself for waking up in the morning. That's yes. That. It's hard to get up in the morning. I'm not a morning person either. I, I'm inspired. I love it. Nice work. All right, Jude. Awesome. So now we're moving to Amy Adkins. And so we are into the spiders. Spider people. Do me proud, people. Go. All right. So, okay, I need to share. Oh, maybe. Do you guys see it? Yes, we can. Yep. All right. Let me just present it. Okay. So my project is about sound pollution versus spiders. Oh. And our goal is to inspire and educate students everywhere through real science and exploration. So going into this project, I had heard about sound pollution through different animals like mainly oceanic animals or um, other <laughs> like birds stuff like that so when I started this program I started to think like are like the tiny creepy crawlies are they as affected as other animals so I asked the problem why are some arachnid species affected by noise pollution and other species are not so my hypothesis was based off of um, what I had read previously on the interwebs. Um, I read about web-dwelling spiders who are less negatively affected by sound and ground-dwelling spiders are usually more affected by sound. So my hypothesis was web-dwelling spiders are less negatively affected by noise than ground-dwelling spiders. This is due to the sound absorbing properties of webs. What? And you don't have to read all this, but it's the specimens that um, I managed to catch in my backyard. We're quite near the country, so it was surprisingly easy. I got a female fur orb weaver on the left hand side there and a male rabid wolf spider. And you'll notice the male is a six legged spider because he is a trooper. And the materials and methods that I did was um, for testing, I tested how these two spiders reacted to sound and which of the two is more affected by it. The location of the study was in the United States, obviously, <laughs> in Newark, Ohio, uh, in my own house. I had spiders in my own house. The animals are of course in captivity and in a controlled environment. The tools that I used were my computer to play three sounds and the three sounds I used are common where I am and throughout the world. So the chances of them hearing them would be pretty likely. And the sounds are a leaf blower, a lawnmower and construction of any kind really. I also use my field notebook for notes and my camera for filming and pictures. So continued. Uh, the steps I used was done by many scientists. It's called a focal follow. Uh, it's basically where I write down what they do minute by minute in extreme detail in case I miss something important or I disregard something that doesn't seem important and it actually is. So I played the sound for two minutes in the end. It changed from five minutes to three minutes to two minutes and basically wrote what they did. Or if I filmed them, I would rewatch the video and decipher what they did. And how I recorded the data was obviously through filming and pictures, as well as writing down everything that happened in my field journal. I also sketched what the two species looked like. Um, and then from there, I tried to organize it into a way that would make it easier to understand. So continuing into the field notebook, uh, the tools I used were um, iNaturalist for usually um, the species identification and location. I use my iPod for filming and pictures. The iPod has an integrated microphone and the camera is an eyesight camera. 
And then I use Sotophonic uh, for deciphering the sounds recorded, like getting the frequencies or finding patterns in the sounds. Um, part three, <laughs> my sampling rate. Um, this is the average um, decibel level that I got from all the sounds. Um, and I would test these three, well, two to three times a day as often as I could. And uh, throughout this project, I mainly got qualitative data, I noticed, which was, it was okay, but like, you don't have to read everything on here. But um, how I would record it is I would do an evening or a morning focal follow. I would um, list the date, the weather, the temperature, the environment, the specimen, so either the wolf spider or the furrow orb weaver, then the time I started, and then the sound I used and uh, the observations I noticed. So at the bottom was a little snippet of uh, one of the days I did it where the furrow orb weaver was a little more active. Uh, she was walking around but stood still when I played the sound. She turned and walked down and the body language presented shows that she is discomforted by the sound. She also appears confused and unsure of what to do keeps changing her mind of where she wants to go, keeps flailing her legs around, might be feeling her web, and be overwhelmed by the noise that's being played. And then I'd list how long I did it for. And here I have the two pictures that I tried my best to sketch. Um, I'm quite proud of them. <laughs> um, so um, on the left no. is the furrow orb weaver, and the right is the male rabbit wolf spider. The quantitative data I collected was the measurements of the two spiders, which was quite difficult to get. I had to guess a little bit. Um, I had to look up the average size, the average weight, and then kind of decipher if it was close. And then the decibel levels um, I also got. I got the average decibel levels and the maximum. But uh, due to complications, I only recorded a few decibel levels, which isn't my fault. <laughs> but um, the sounds I chose were sounds that were commonly heard where I live and pretty much anywhere. They're deemed as types of sound pollution. Even though they are quite normal sounds for us, they can be quite damaging to many populations of animals, including insects and spiders. Since we don't often see them or are afraid of them, we tend not to think what we do to them. And these decibel levels can be quite damaging physically and psychologically. You do not have to read all this. I will sum it down. So I mainly got qualitative data and um, my hypothesis stated that the web dwelling spider would be the less affected of the two. But I found out that my data did not support that. So through the two months of October and November, and I recorded these two spiders and I compared them to different uh, studies that had been done. Um, since orb weavers are known to do well in busy human environments, I figured that my data would be somewhat similar, but it wasn't. The orb weaver was the most affected of the two. The spider that was known to thrive in loud environments was the most affected. She would squirm and show extreme discomfort to the sound. She would furiously tap her legs on her web and attack the walls of her home. I did feel very evil. The wolf spider pretty much showed me no reaction to anything I did. He would instead adopt the behavior of playing dead until I left. He would also stay on the wall when I played the sounds. Wolf spiders have tiny hairs on their legs that are used, uh, sorry, that are used to sense vibrations in the ground to help them catch their prey. He would always stay on the wall so the sound wouldn't um, overwhelm him, seeing as sound is absorbed through the ground. And since the orb weaver's um, web is her home, the web was on the ground and walls of her container. Instinctually, she would know not to leave that web. That's her protection. That's where she catches prey. She wouldn't want to leave. So when she is fiercely tapping on her web and wondering, what is the sound? She's just trying to make sense of her world. And she was completely overwhelmed by it. But even though um, one was more affected than the other, they eventually did fall into a pace of where they adapted quite quickly to what I was doing and basically showed no behavior after the first few weeks. Oh, okay. Um, so these are the links to the sounds on YouTube that I played to them. Um, and I also got some videos of the 
spiders reacting. Um, it, it, it's a too long video, but uh, in this she does show her tapping behavior on her web and it's pretty interesting to watch. And over here you have the male rabbit wolf spider who basically does nothing. So um, I also got the recordings. Um, there's 30 seconds clip, there's, thir ah, sorry. There are 30 second clips and they are in my mind quite annoying. And of course the location I got my data was Ohio and Newark. Um, the animals were in captivity, so it'd be easier on me and I wouldn't have to run the risk of finding no spiders. I caught the female orb weaver, as I said, and the male rab rabbit wolf spider in my own backyard. Um, we obviously live quite close to the country, so it was very e fairly easy. I also know that due to Ohio's climate, winter was coming quickly and I wanted my spiders to be secure so it wouldn't compromise the project. And these are the photos I took as a professional photographer. And um, yeah, it just kind of shows you their differences biologically and how they look. Okay, so the results and conclusions, um, I think I'll just read this. The result I got from my project was not at all what I had expected. It left me more curious than I first was. Out of the two specimens, the web dwelling spider and the ground dwelling spider, which is the orb weaver and wolf spider, the web dwelling spider was the most affected and troubled by the noise. So my hypothesis was incorrect. The reason why she was more affected is really unclear. I have a few ideas, my main one being the orb weaver couldn't escape from the situation and the wolf spider could. The web is her home, that is how she senses things, and she wouldn't want to leave her home. Since she senses things through her web, as that is how she catches prey, she would rely on it heavily. And when the sound played, her furious tapping on her web was her trying to make sense of the noise presented to her. Whereas the wolf spider is much different biologically. They don't live high up on a web, they live in the ground. They sense sound through tiny hairs on their legs. They can feel the vibrations of prey or other sounds, like motorized uh, vehicles. That is why they were known to be affected because all sound is absorbed into the ground where they live. But he would escape to the walls where the sound was less of a burden. In conclusion, my hypothesis was incorrect. The orb weaver was more affected by the sounds than the wolf spider. The reasons for why are only in the form of ideas, which I would really like to test. Uh, the reflections, um, I'm just gonna read this again because um, it's really important to me that you guys know how much I appreciate you. So looking back on this project, I know I really enjoyed it. It really eliminated any bad perspectives I had on spiders. They're actually pretty exceptional creatures and are needed in our world's ecosystem. I also found this out about spiders. Spiders are tough little creatures. They can take almost anything that is thrown at them, even sound pollution. And even though it's true most animals and some species of spider do not do well in noisy areas of a natural sound, some species of spider use the changes we inflict on their world to their advantage. I sent an article to another Argonaut peer who is studying orb weavers as well. In this article, it talks about how over 80 orb weaver spiders, which confused me even more, live on the loudest and busiest, not to mention brightest bridge in France, but somehow they thrive on it. Even in the midst of sound pollution, as well as light pollution, they can successfully get more prey than those of more wilder environments. To me, that's just amazing. Spiders are amazing in adapting to their situation and looking for ways to better improve it. For example, my spiders ex adapted to what I was doing to them. In fact, they learned the time I would do it. And through the weeks, it built up a resistance toward the sounds I played. If I was to do this project differently, I would keep in mind that spiders are smarter than we really think. They adapt quickly to things, so maybe I would have to keep things fresh and new for them. This was an incredible experience, and I will not forget it. I have grown very attached to my two spiders, and I am not ashamed of that. I'm totally okay with being a bug dork. It's pretty cool. However, I learned more than just science in this project. I learned about teamwork, friendship, leadership, and to give creepy crawlers more credit. And if one thing I know about science, it's that it never ends. And that's the one thing I love about it. And here we have the resources and credits where the um, 
these are the websites and the photos I took and used. And um, that is all I have for you guys. Wow, that's amazing. I think you have to share every to everybody uh, what your little brothers had to say about oh. the spiders. I had some serious street cred as a sister, okay? <laughs> they love the fact that their sister had, a sp had two spiders in the house. In fact, my little brother Gideon helped me name them. What'd you um, name them? So um, it's after a movie we watched quite recently and we decided to name the male rabid wolf spider Inigo and the female Montoya. Awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, Pri that's priceless. So good. Priceless. It's so good. That was really, that was really beautiful. And I, I loved, I wrote in the chat, but I'll say it here. Like, I love the way that you, that you wrapped in science narrative and that you really used empathy in your research. You really tried to put yourself into the shoes of the spider and 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 i i thought that that really showed in in your presentation and um oh, you made me cry a little bit it <laughs> was lovely that was lovely all right i think we have two more two more hope and the spider group and then we'll wrap it up okay okay awesome right. thank so, you amy thank you amy and hope is next All right. Hi, everybody. Hey, Hope. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Hope. Hi, I'm Hope Bradshaw. Um, I'm from Meadowbrook Middle School in uh, Bysville, Ohio. I teach uh, middle school science. And um, for my slides, just so it would be nice and quick, I was trying to stick through the three minutes if we could. Um, I just kind of took a little bit, like the main highlights of my slides, because my slides were over 33 slides long. So I just, I just took a few and just put them together. Um, so let me go ahead. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Alrighty. So, um, I chose to do, um, cricket behaviors in the presence of their predators. Cause every time I would go outside, I would hear crickets constantly. And I think that's a lot of reason why it clicked with so many of us to use the crickets. Um, and I also have cardinals in my backyard too. And I know cardinals are predators for the crickets. So um, I do have a quick little video clip here, hopefully it'll play, um, of a cardinal that I got recorded in my backyard. And actually um, right below where the cardinal is sitting is where I took the picture of the cricket right here. So. Do you have a headset on, Hope? No, I don't. Okay, so we're not hearing it. So you might have to make sure the volume is really up high. Okay. Um, it just, you can see the bird there and the bird was chirping, um, so that it wasn't really spectacular. We're just showing where I kind of got my idea from. So, um, so my main problem would do, do crickets change the sounds that they make in response to hearing their predator, the cardinal? So that was just uh, my basic, just do their sounds change, do their behaviors change? Um, so my hypothesis was that if I play a recording of cardinal sounds to a group of crickets in a laboratory setting, then the crickets will change the sounds they produce in response. So that was my hypothesis. <clears throat> okay, so I decided instead of, because I never know if cardinals, the cardinals are gonna be out there. We, crickets are usually there a lot, but the cardinals would be the hard thing to control. So that's why I decided to move everything uh, indoors so I could control everything around us. So this is my setup. Um, this is just a picture. This is actually where I'm sitting right now. This would have been right in front of me and I had it set there the whole time. Um, so over here, I set up an old phone and I downloaded an app. I think it was called um, Alfred. And it was just kind of like, a you could set up and click it at any time to record. The only downfall with that is that it only recorded 30 seconds at a time. So I would record 30 seconds and then on and off back and forth for the 30 seconds to get, I eventually did it for 10 minutes each time that I did it. Um, and it kind of propped up here with their food bottle here. Here are my crickets. I had, I started with 10 male crickets. And then I eventually, you know, once we figured out, we hey, we need to move the females out. I put the females over here and there were five in there. Um, I had a thermometer here and I also had a space heater because the room that I'm in right now, I, I live in a split level house. 
and it's kind of halfway underground, so it's kind of cooler. So actually, the space heater right here now on me because I was cold. <laughs> But yeah, I kept that on there so and then I could control the, the temperature here and make sure it didn't get too hot or too cold for them. Um, and I left the females here because we know that's why the males chirp is so they can attract the females, their mates. Um, so I put them here so I thought maybe I can entice them to start chirping because for I had them for two weeks before they even made one chirp. And uh, so finally they started chirping after two weeks and I'm like, yes. Um, but the problem with that, like uh, Nimdi said earlier um, in the beginning, is that every time you came near them, they stopped chirping. So um, I would leave the lights off, leave everything. I would just quietly come in and through the door, and then I would sit in the back on the couch, the one that's behind me, and uh, they would just stop all of a sudden. Like that. I could hear them chirping before I come in, but I had to come in because I had to play the cardinal sounds that I had found that I'd used. And so I did that for oh, three days and I'm like, I bet it would work if I just slipped my phone that was playing the cardinal sound under the door and I sat outside. So I would actually wait because I needed to get some data because I didn't have any data. And I said, okay, I'm gonna wait till I hear them really loud. And um, so I heard them, the, the one day that I really got good data, I heard them chirping a lot. And so I recorded them for 30 seconds so I could see how their baseline data, like what they were when, uh, how they were chirping when they weren't um, being bothered. And then I slipped my phone under the door and I played it and it was almost instant. Like you could see, the, like hear the difference and see the difference in the video. So before they were hopping around and they were chirping all over the place. And as soon as they heard those, it was like most of them went and hid and then there was only one, one cricket that continued to chirp, but it went from 21 chirps to, I think it was four chirps in, in the 30 seconds. So it, it was drastic. And then after that, it was silence. So I really got one day to, one day with really good data. Um, so let me go ahead and move past here. So this was my, um, my visual that I created here. I actually drew this picture and then uh, colored it in as best as I could with uh, still learning how to use some of the apps and how you do the coloring on that. But um, so I put one of my graphs over here and you can see the number of cricket chirps in 30 seconds. So this is the day, the day number four where I got the really good data. So you can see they're chirping like crazy up here and then it dropped clear down here to three. Um, the day before I got one chirp and before and then they and then they stopped. So and then here on day five, they were chirping really, really good until I went to hit my record button and my dog barked outside the door. <laughs> so that's why I was like, oh man. Uh, but then I, I kind of stopped taking my data then because they started dying. It was like going on th week three and they were just, they just started dying. Um, but in my infographic here, I've got my cardinal up here uh, chirping. And then I have this one, he's saying, shh, hide. But then this cricket here that's closer to the female, he's got his eyes on the female and he's not paying attention whatsoever. And um, I have a picture I'm gonna show you to support why I put that on there. Um, this was another graph that I did here. This was their movement. Since I didn't get a lot of uh, sounds chirping, um, I was looking for their movement and their behaviors. So on this first day here, this was the day that I separated the females from them. So in the videos, um, and, and they're all in my original slides, there's links to those in there. You can see that they were, they didn't care what was going on, even though they were quiet at that time, they were still, their focus was on the females beside them. And they were all trying to hop towards them and looking at them. And so that's why um, it took them 10 minutes to stop moving um, after the sound was played. And then it dropped down the next day was six. And then you can kind of see here, it was a lot more, um, I don't know if they were losing their focus on the females on those days here or what, but it, it was a lot less time for them to kind of freeze or hide and stop moving around. Um, here was, again, this was the day that I had a lot of data and we can see here, um, I used Audacity and you can see each one of these was cricket chirps because there was no other sounds in the room. And then down here below, this is the first 30 seconds when I played uh, the, the cardinal sounds and this is all cardinal sounds. And then this is a teeny little chirp. It was kind of like scared to make that chirp. And then there was one down here that was almost identical to this, but this is where they only had three chirps versus the 21 chirps after they heard the sounds. So um, I 
based on the little bit of data I have, um, because you know they just weren't chirping a whole lot, I would say it was correct, but to really say it was correct, I would want more data um, to, to see that. Um, but even though they didn't chirp a lot when they were chirping and the cardinal sound was played, the time between the chirps decreased until they stopped altogether. And um, if there wasn't any cricket chirping, the movement of the crickets changed until they were hiding or frozen in place. So here was the picture. This was the day I was actually working on my slides and I kind of had moved everything around. And so this one wasn't actually part of my experiment. But you can see how much closer the females are. She's, I don't know how well you can see it, but she's right here. And look at every single male where their attention is. They are just, and I was this close, like I did not zoom in. I was this close to their encounter and, their, and, and to their cage, and they did not care one bit. Their focus was entirely on these females over here. So, um, so that gave me another question, which um, uh, somebody else was trying to uh, answer earlier was the vicinity with the females. And then in nature, if the females near them, is that gonna cause them to um, get eaten up a lot quicker? You know, especially uh, when they're all they have is one other thing on their mind and they're not worrying about their safety. So, um, so yeah, that was mine real quick. And um, I don't know, I really enjoyed it. Um, I like doing this experiment um, because as a teacher, we kind of lose the basics. And I even teach the scientific method. And I feel sometimes we get real structured, like it has to look like this. And doing this whole um, Argo experiment uh, with you guys and getting to talk to you guys all week, uh, every week, um, and just seeing that you can be loose and just figure out where the data takes you and go from there. So I, I'm taking that back to my students and just saying it doesn't have to be as structured as it was I, I once was saying and like, let's just see where the data takes us. So, all right, thanks. <clears throat> You'll have to look at Patrick's uh, comments about <laughs> the crickets in the chat. I won't reread it here, but it was a good one, Pat. Um, oh, that was awesome. Well Thank done, you Hope. So much for sharing that. And everyone in the comments, you'll see when you shared that picture, that extra observation that wasn't part of your experiment, when you shared that with all the crickets, like, <laughs> I mean, it's that kind of stuff that will lead people, mm -hmm. even in their science careers, into going, oh, this is what I study now. Yeah. This moment is actually what I'm studying. So that's beautiful. Yeah. And, and hope you, you hit the nail on the head too, when you were saying that science is a, is, is a loose process, you know, cause if you try and keep it in this sort of rigid box, you can lose so much stuff like that last observation that you made. So mm -hmm. well done. Well done. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. Alrighty. We what, have one what, more group, right? the spider group and the spider group is from all over the place. They're from Wetzel School District, Spring, Spring in Texas, Gidmore in Texas, and Peter in Rhode Island, and all of that. So I will mute myself. And I think, who did they decide? Who's, who's going to go first? Who's, um, I think you can pin all four of them, but who's presenting their screen? I'll be uh, presenting. OK, Aiden. All right, uh, let me get this set up. All right, so hello everybody. My name is Peter Muhich. I worked with what has become known as the Spider Group, um, consisting of uh, myself, Faith Yoho, Carolyn Heiser, uh, Aidan Massengill, Mary Lee, uh, in collaboration with Amy Atkins. Our work centralized around the question, how can we produce sound um, consciously so that it is beneficial to the environment, similar to how we make uh, deliberate individual choices to mitigate other forms of uh, pollution. Um, to develop parameters for such a beneficial sound, we first examined uh, the nature of what we've termed detrimental sound. And initially, we thought that would be some form of anthropogenic noise, but we soon found out it is much more complex than that. So at this point, um, I'm going to turn it over to Aiden to talk a little bit about uh, what we did to explore these questions. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Aiden Massengill. Um, so what we did was we tested on pretty much any spider that built a web 
Um, now, the availability of these spiders was hindered because in the middle of our research, we all got kind of hit by this cold spell. Um, but there are, luckily, there's over 22,000 species of spiders which construct webs. So we were able to find a few. All right, Peter, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. All right. Um, so as you can see, we tested in Beeville, Texas, Spring, Texas, Padden City, Padden City West Virginia, um, Exeter, Rhode Island, and Newark, Ohio. Um, so we were all over the place. Um, while testing, we looked for any physical response that um, to, to the sound, like shaking, walking, or even jumping off the web. Um, and as you'll see from our results in the next few slides, we didn't get too many responses, but the ones we did seemed pretty, um, pretty upset. All right, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Peter. All right, so our materials were a smartphone, a ruler, tone gen app, and then a few different sounds off of that. Um, in order to test, we would hold our smartphone about 12 inches from the web, and we'd play a tone of about 440 hertz at different uh, volumes. Um, we did the same with the anthropogenic noise and uh, sounds like traffic, um, and then sounds like nature. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide. You have the, uh, just the sound clip to share. Everyone hear that? Yes, we heard that, Peter. Right. Um, here is an example of one of our calibration tables, which shows the um, uh, decibel level for our 440 hertz noise that we play for all the spiders. Um, that was both the uh, anthropogenic sound and the natural sound. Um, so as you heard, we played that beautiful traffic sound, which the spiders seem to love and then the uh, river sounds for the natural sound. Um, so you can go ahead and jump to the next slide. And here's some pictures of Peter's beautiful field notebook, um, which was super well organized and helped us a lot. And then another example of, of our calibration tables where we transfer that into the computer so we could actually get our percentages. And then there's a picture of an orb weaver, just a common spotted orb weaver that I took a picture of outside. Um, that's the same web that I would later walk through while taking the trash out. So it didn't last long. All right. Um, and now I'll go ahead and hand it over to Mary and she will explain her infographic. So for our infographic, you can see on the 18%, we decided to use the Tone Gen app to simulate a sine wave drone. It's only 18%. The anthropogenic traffic noise is basically man-made noises and it only affected the spiders out of our databases. 14% and the bottom picture simulates nature sounds such as the river noises we talked about and it's only 9%. And obviously I'm no mathematician, but if you add all the numbers, it doesn't equal to 100%. So Faith, why don't you explain them what happened? So when we started this project, we really thought it was going to be way more black and white than it was. And we thought that we were going to be able to create a beneficial sound or figure out what is a detrimental sound to our spiders. When in reality, we kind of decided that maybe there is no beneficial or detrimental sound, and maybe it's just how loud that sound is played or the certain tone of that sound. And although we may not have been able to collect the data that we originally planned, we managed to pose a question that future Argonauts can work towards answering, and we made ourselves accountable for our effect on the environment. And to quote our lovely Christy, she told us that science is a process and often the process of observation. Asking questions and testing those questions only leads to more questions. When data, are in, when data are inconclusive, it gives us the opportunity to ask again and focus our questions and experiments. The process of arriving at data, inconclusive or not, is science. And we really would just like to thank the Jason Argonaut program, especially the bug chicks and everyone that supported us and Amy for allowing us to use her data. And also, especially Christy, because from the moment that Peter sort of had this amazing idea that he created and I sort of jumped on it and we talked to her about it that night, she was 100% supportive for us. And anytime we text her in the group chat, she's always answering our questions and she's really been our biggest cheerleader throughout this entire program. And the one good thing that came from COVID definitely was being able to be on this virtual program and meet my amazing little spider group and the rest of our Argonauts. And we are all very grateful for that opportunity. Oh, you guys, that's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I noticed um, on the slide, Beville. Who was collecting data in Beville? That was me. Okay, Aiden. Uh, but that's not where you go to school, is it? No, ma'am. I live in Skidmore. It's just about five-minute drive. Okay, so cool. 
because there was another bee thing with the bee, bee stuff there. So you guys did awesome. Is there anybody that we accidentally missed that wants to, that I, oh, I know what, I have to share the... Um, Just real quick, that was everyone saying beautiful coordination. When you have more than two people in a group, it is difficult on Zoom to present information in a cohesive and clear way. We were all very impressed by that. And of course, impressed by your project, but just really great, Pat said, great science storytelling. And so that was awesome. Thank you. That was, that was really great. Yes, and I just wanted to share um, Carter and Heidi's um, screen infographic because oh, yeah. I said I would. So uh, I don't know if Carter, if you guys want to jump in and share. I did find it. It was hiding right in front of me. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so basically, you're showing the bottom half of the infographic. Uh, there's a top half. Oh, there you go. And so that's our title, uh, Rural versus Urban Cricket Noise Potential, the Dodgers County, West Virginia Argonauts. So basically what I found was just kind of weird. I mean, it's astounding in itself, but it's weird is that um, our urban audible testing percentage was 100 percent, 10 for 10. And you don't get much better than that. However, if you were to scroll down to the bottom and look at me and Heidi's testing percentage in the rural area, you get a massive 7.31% which is just not the same. So I don't really know, like, I don't really know what happened here. Um, but yeah, that basically, you know, we kept track of um, temperature and humidity. And obviously those two factors played a huge role in uh, the uh, information we were able to receive or lack thereof. But, you know, it happens. And like a lot of these uh, great presenters today have said, no data is data. Um, I would have loved to do this project in June or July, you know, but, um, that's what science is all about. It takes you different places. And because of this, you're able to branch one question into four different questions. And then that's the beauty of the process. And that's the beauty of science in general. So, yeah. Nice way to sum it up, Carter. Thank yeah. you. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. So just one more thing. I'm going to share a couple of things for you guys. Um, and that is you, you are amazing. I mean, if I, was a teacher giving a grade for this? There's no scale high enough. You guys went above and beyond um, expectations. You really engaged fully um, with not just your head, but with your hearts. And that was, um, that was really, really amazing. So I'll send these links out to you again, but we talked about them briefly last time is that, you know, our whole purpose here was to really kind of try to develop some citizen science and you guys have done citizen science so now I think on your resumes um, you should call yourself a Jason learning citizen scientist because you are and you you've achieved that so yeah I know it's it's truly truly amazing so as Pat mentioned at the beginning you are now officially Argonaut alumni. And so I will be in sending you an invite. We have an Argonaut alumni Facebook group. Um, so I'm always, I know I'm not everybody, Facebook isn't all that cool. So if anybody has, I'm always learning from you guys, you know, another place or way to pe keep people in touch because you have really, um, I think Faith was talking about it, there's, made these connections from people, you know, thousands of miles away and friendships and I think collaborations. And I think, you know, whatever field you guys go into, um, and I know Madison, by the way, congratulations, she got two acceptance letters from colleges today. Um, not her top, but she knows that one's gonna come. So there's all kinds of things that we should celebrate. So I may in like a month after Thanksgiving or something, just say, hey, here's a Zoom session if you wanna wanna join in. Um, so, a couple more things. Uh, a couple of you have I sent uh, a link to an exit survey. Uh, Madison and Lucy and Carter, when I looked at it last, had completed it. Ah, overachievers, I love you guys. So please um, 
complete the exit survey, I'll send the link again to do this. So we count on you guys so that exit survey gives us information. I don't know how we could make this better, but you can always learn from stuff. And so we need your put input to figure out, like Pat said, we have some other school districts that are interested in trying to do this. So if you're interested, some of you may need to come back on as um, mentors or examples or role models. So, you know, um, if I reach out and say, hey, we've got this school district involved, anybody interested and willing, we're ready to do that kind of thing. So I'm going to hush. And if anybody wants to add a few more things or say anything else um, to the group before we close off our session, I will give you time to do that. But I think Christy looks like she might have something to say. Yes, there's the email. Congratulations, Always. Madison. Mm -hmm. Just remember, I don't know that if everyone was here a couple weeks ago when I jumped the gun and got all emotional. Here's the deal. From here on out, Jessica and I, as the Buck Chicks, are here for you. Reference letters, college reference letters, job reference letters. If you are nervous about an interview for a job when you're in your 30s, I know like a long time from now, you can call us and be like, will you go over this with me? It's kind of a big deal. Jessica and I will now always be in your lives as mentors and friends. And this is very, very, this is what we love to do. Okay. Yeah. And I just have really, really loved this. And teachers, thank you so much for being guides by the side, but also diving in as students yourselves and, and bringing your incredible enthusiasm to this. You were really um, role models to the students as well. And we just, we just can't thank you enough. People, yeah. I adore each and every one of you. I've loved this. I'm gonna miss you next Thursday. And when I'm having Thanksgiving turkey with Jessica, <laughs> we're gonna be talking about you people, so. Yeah, because you really impressed us yeah. this this session because um, we didn't know really what to expect going into it either since this was new for, for everybody. And I got to say, I, I've had a ton of fun. I've had a ton of fun and I'm super impressed with you guys. And I am really proud of you. Y'all have done some really great work here. Each and every one of you. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we can I would just like to like 930. Yeah. If I can have the, the last um, moment here, uh, I do want to extend what Christy just said, uh, include Jude and I in that list of people you can reach out to anytime. If yep. you ever need anything, please keep in touch. Um, you know, the, the reason why we do what we do at Jason is because we're trying to inspire students and teachers out there to, to love science, to pursue STEM careers, to, to do all the things that we believe in. And I think it's safe to say that you guys have inspired us um, even more than we've probably inspired you this time around. So I just want to say thank you so much again. Um, you guys have been amazing and um, you're part of the family now. So keep in touch. Yes, like Amy said one time, you're never ever going to get away from us. And I've gotten a couple of texts <laughs> from uh, people who are watching the live streaming and saying you were amazing. Um, that they thought your presentations just knocked it out of the ballpark. So, you know, we are all biased because we help you do that. So these are people who didn't know you and are just amazed and just uh, so proud of you. And I think if you all wanted jobs, I think you would get a job instantly with anybody that was um, watching our presentations tonight. So again, big hugs to everybody. Um, you know, if we were doing a virtual campfire, there would be, you know, lots of blubbering and crying. I don't do that, but Pat will keep my secret. Oh, no, Pat. So again, thank you all. Um, I will be sending more emails, so don't think that's going to end. Um, I'll keep uh, reminding you of a few things that I need to have done. And as Christy said, you know, we're here for you, um, you know. Jason never ends. We'll keep after you. Thank you all, everybody. You've been troopers. This went twice as long as we thought it would go. So. Yeah. Thank you for hanging with us. <laughs> worth every minute. Hanging out. It was worth every minute.